Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. I'm Natalie Davis, um, and thank you all for coming today. We are so thrilled to have such a large group as we talk with Dr. Liz Fowler, the Deputy Administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, commonly known as CMS, and the current Director for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, often referred to as CMI or the Innovation Center. Um, we'll get to talk with Liz in just a minute and take your questions as well. Um, but first, let me share some background on the United States of Care. As I said, I'm Natalie Davis, CEO and co-founder at United States of Care. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization committed to ensuring that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care. And we do that work in a lot of ways, but it always starts with understanding people's true needs for their health care system. And that research started over two years ago, talking to thousands of people and continuing every day, guides us in our vision for the future where all people have dependable health care that meets their unique needs at a price they can afford. To meet to, when we talk to people, this means better, building a better health care system based on four goals. People have the certainty they can afford their health care. People have the security and freedom that dependable health care coverage provides as life changes. People can get personalized care they need when and how they need it. And they can experience a healthcare system that is understandable and easy to navigate. United States of Care's work and what we hear from people is the North Star we believe as change makers and healthcare, which is why all of you are here today, can focus our efforts and the reminder of why we're building a better healthcare system. And of course, this uh, includes how we pay for healthcare differently. And that's the work, of course, that Liz and CMMI lead. We share a lot of common goals, of course, with improving the healthcare system and have been engaged with uh, CMMI, CMMI and other parts of CMS since this new administration. We work to bring together different voices from across the general public, our healthcare system, providers, advocates, industry, as well as all of our lessons from our public engagement and work across the country to inform st their strategy. We've provided recommendations on grounding the work in people's needs and keeping equity at the forefront, all of which we can see reflected in the strategy. And we recognize that may Making meaningful change requires bringing United States of Care's unique perspectives and all of our partners. Um, I am sure Liz will share in her remarks, CMMI's work directly affects tens of millions of people with incredible flexibility to try new things to make sure that care can be dependable, affordable, personalized, and a system that we can understand. And we're here today because, of, as many of you know, the Innovation Center just rolled out its refresh strategy for the next decade. Liz has built a remarkable healthcare policy career in both the public and private sectors, having worked in high level positions at the Commonwealth Fund, Johnson & Johnson, the Obama White House, Department of Health and Human Services, Senator Mac Max Bacchus's office, and so much more. And we're so excited to have you here today, Liz. Thank you for your service to this country. And I'm pleased to hand it over to you to talk about the strategy and how it centers equity to meet the needs of people. So much, Natalie. I'm really happy to be here and really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our um, strategy. Um, and I don't know if um, it's possible. I think, I think yes, slides. There we go. Thank you. Um, just a few introductory remarks and then I'll get to the slides. Um, but since joining the Innovation Center in March, um, we've spent a lot of time reflecting on what we've accomplished over the last decade and tried to use those lessons to inform our direction for the next 10 years. And coming into this role, I, I really see my purpose and my role as twofold. Um, first of all, to provide as much clarity as possible about the direction we're heading. Um, and then also to work as hard as I can and in partnership with the rest of CMS leadership and organizations like US of Care to regain that sense of inevitability that our health, health system is moving away from fever service and toward value-based payment. Um, as you mentioned, Natalie, in October, we released a white paper on the Innovation Website, Innovation Center website uh, that built on the vision and ideas we outlined in an August um, health affairs blog. The goal with the paper was to provide more specific details on where we're heading. Um, some of you might have been able to make it to our rollout event in October um, or maybe one of our subsequent listening sessions, but in case you missed it, I'll provide some 
high level takeaways to orient everyone um, at the top of our time today. So next slide. As part of our effort to define and execute against a refreshed strategy for the future, as I mentioned, we look back to understand what had, we had done well and what we could have done better. We've had a substantial impact over our first 10 years, um, implemented over 50 models that have touched millions of beneficiaries and hundreds of thousands of providers and health plans. Those lessons from the last 10 years we've taken to heart. We've listened carefully to experts, reviewed literature, including the US of Care report, um, and we've outlined a vision for the next 10 years. And we've identified five strategic objectives to guide this work and achieve our vision. The vision is straightforward, a health system that achieves equitable outcomes through high quality, affordable person-centered care. I'll go through each of those individually and talk about how it's going to guide our work. I also wanna say that what we're building here at the Innovation Center fits in really closely with um, what Administrator Brooks LeSure has outlined for CMS more broadly. So we're right in line with where she wants us to be going and um, really happy to have her support and be able to, that our strategy supports her strategy. Um, so next slide. So the first pillar um, is driving accountable care. We've set a central goal for the Innovation Center to increase the number of people in relationships with providers that are accountable for their patients' costs and improving their care. This will require increasing beneficiary access to advanced primary care and ACO models that coordinate with or are integrated with specialty care to meet the full range of patient needs. And when we think about entities that, can, that are accountable for patient care, that includes physician group practices, hospitals, other healthcare providers, Medicare Advantage plans, PACE plans, even Medicaid managed care plans. Um, we've set a goal for ourselves that by 2030, all Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries and a vast majority of Medicaid beneficiaries will be in a care relationship with accountability for quality and total cost of care. Next slide. Advancing health equity has become one of the most important areas of focus for the Innovation Center, for CMS and HHS more broadly, and for the Biden-Harris administration. And as part of our strategy to improve quality, which is part of our statutory mandate, we're committed to embedding equity in all aspects of our Innovation Center models and increasing our focus on underserved populations. This includes a focus on health equity across the life cycle of our models from development to application and selection processes, implementation and evaluation. And this could also include providing technical assistance to ensure that a diversity of providers and a mix of patients um, participate in our models. Um, next slide. So supporting innovation, the Innovation Center can also do more to support model participants that are looking for ways to innovate care delivery approaches. Some of these supports might include actionable and practice specific data, technology, dissemination of best practices, peer-to-peer -peer learning collaboratives, and payment flexibilities. Next slide. Addressing affordability. In addition to our payment models reducing expenditures in Medicare and Medicaid, our models should also have an impact on lowering patients' out-of-pocket costs. This is a priority for our CMS administrator, and we'll be looking at strategies that target healthcare prices, affordability, and reduce unnecessary or duplicative care. Next slide. Partner to achieve system transformation. The last part of our strategy is aimed at furthering the reach of health transformation. We can't do it alone. We need to align our priorities and policies across CMS and work in tandem with commercial payers, purchasers, states, and beneficiaries to achieve our vision. By 2030, we're hoping that all of our new models um, make multi-payer alignment possible. And in the past, we've called it a victory when private payers joined our models or state Medicaid agencies, and that's made a difference. But as much as it was a victory, we believe we can have a greater impact. And so it's not just about joining our specific models. Next slide. I wanna close by offering a few thoughts as to what comes next for the Innovation Center. As part of our commitment to stakeholder engagement and partnership, we've been um, conducting listening sessions. Uh, if you go to our website, you can find information about the two listening sessions we held at the end of last year. One focused generally on the strategy and the second focused on health equity. Uh, we're planning a more, um, more topic specific listening sessions, hoping the next one um, will focus on perspectives from patients. 
Um, your feedback and the perspectives on this new direction are very important to us, and it's one of the reasons I'm excited to be here today. So I hope you'll share our, your ideas with us so that together we can help make a meaningful difference um, in our health system. And maybe Natalie, on that note, I'll end my presentation and look forward to engaging in a dialogue with you and the rest of the audience. Great. Thank you, Liz. One of the questions, the question I'd like to start with really is um, providing a quote that was recently in a blog post um, from you, Administrator uh, Chiquita brooks Lashore and Medicare Director Amina Sashimini, um, which included the line, as women of color who have dedicated our careers to improving the healthcare system in the US, we know that disparities have been especially magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic and have put an enormous strain on families and individuals. I'd love to hear more about this, about how your life and um, has really influenced how you look at the, the center's ability to, to make change and really have an equity focused strategy. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, well, I would say my career path was shaped by the two most important people in my life. Um, my father, who was a primary care physician and really inspired an interest in health and healthcare policy. And my mother, who moved to this country from Taiwan without a college degree and a new baby, that was me, uh, worked her way through college and became an accountant. And so from her, I learned you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, as I think about e equity, I think about my grandmother, who was a non-English speaking dual eligible who lived in Texas. She had a number of health conditions that weren't very well managed. Coordinating her care required the support of my mother, aunt, and uncles who had to help navigate the health system on her behalf and had to go with her to all of her appointments to help translate for her doctors. And so when I think about some of the models um, of care delivery and how they could have helped um, her and her care and coordinated her care better um, and been sensitive to her specific needs, I think that's what inspires me and what I think about when I think about health equity. Great, and as you think back over, you know, we're a decade into the launch of Innovation Center and you were in the room when the ACA was written and then in the administration when CMMI was created, you know, I'm pretty regularly relay, relaying the United States of Care origin story where I was, the notebook I wrote in, you know, those those moments and feelings of, of really starting something new. I'd love to hear how you, um, you know, your version of the CMMI origin story and how the Innovation Center was created, why it was created, and what are some of the things you're the proudest of? Sure. Well, first, I love that you have a US of Care origin story, and someday you'll have to share it to me because in all the meetings we've had, I have not heard that. So uh, would love to hear more. Um, for the Innovation Center, the rationale really dates back to 2009 um, when we were um, all of us staffers working on the Affordable Care Act. and. I would say there were just as many members in the Senate uh, where I worked for the Senate Finance Committee who wanted to find ways of bending the healthcare cost curve um, as there were members who wanted to expand coverage to the uninsured. Of course, there were folks that were fo focused on both, but, um, but really, um, I think as we looked around for policies that would reduce healthcare spending and increase quality and increase outcomes, there really weren't a lot of ideas that had been tried and tested and could be implemented. And so the Innovation Center was created to generate and test new approaches for payment and delivery system reform in Medicare and to a lesser extent, Medicaid. And if they worked, they could be spread, spread across the program, um, expanded in, in scope and um, duration. And so um, when ACA passed and the Innovation Center was created, there was a lot of momentum around um, getting away from fee for service and towards a system that rewarded volume or value instead of volume, sorry. And we carried that momentum forward, like I said, and launched more than 50 models. I think the proudest accomplishment um, was really, you know, a legislation, the ACA, that all fit together, that the pieces were all supposed to be working in tandem. Um, you know, personally sitting on the Senate floor and in the House gallery and attending the sign signing ceremony when ACA was signed, I think it's made a tremendous difference for millions of people who now have health coverage. Yeah, I I, I very much agree and was um, a part of the the kind of you know other part of the CMS that was started during that time the where the federal marketplace was created and launched and and it was like you said it's such an impactful moment in someone's career to be a part of of that. 
Um, so as you said, uh, you know, everyone's biggest concern, um, it really is the cost in the system, both the cost to the individual, and we hear stories about that daily of people unable to afford the care that they need or the insurance that they need, um, but as well as the cost to the overall healthcare system. You know, what are, as you think about your strategy and the future of our, of our overall healthcare system and the work that we can do, how do you think about um, kind of wrangling the overall costs, which really is part of the mandate of the Innovation Center? Well, our statutory mandate is to test payment and service delivery models um, with the intention of reducing costs while preserving or enhancing the quality of care. We hope that our models improve quality and reduce costs, um, but we also consider it a success if a model is able to do one while holding the other constant. And a model that meets one of these three criteria can be expanded in duration and scope through rulemaking. Um, that's a long way of saying that our center was created to be part of the solution in holding down overall healthcare costs. There were arguments as to whether um, we have done so successfully. Um, only six models have generated statistically significant savings to taxpayers and Medicare, and only four models met the standard to be expanded in duration and scope. Um, those include the home health value-based purchasing model, the pioneer ACO model, the Medicare diabetes prevention program, and prior authorization for repetitive scheduled non-emergency um, ambulance services. So this was really one of the impetuses for engaging in the strategy refresh. We really wanted to take a step back and figure out, you know, what have we accomplished and how to amplify our impact. And I think getting more people into relationships with providers that are accountable for their care is really a key to holding down overall costs and really improving care and quality for patients. Um, but you also have to think about costs from the perspective of people, and that's where the affordability objective comes in. Uh, we want our models to have an impact on people's pockets, their pocketbooks, as well as the government's. Great. So you laid out in the direction of the Innovation Center that there was a, a real focus on embedding equity throughout, whether that was um, you know, using models that help specific populations that have been underserved, testing models that address social determinants of health, including under-resourced providers and tests, stronger data collection, analysis, and so on. Um, you know, how can you say more about how the Innovation Center is thinking about putting these sort of um, things into practice um, and, and what's in motion to make that all possible? What do you need from the healthcare ecosystem, et cetera? Sure. Well, First, let's start with the definition of health equity at CMS. Um, we've defined health equity as attainment of the highest level of health for all people, where, pe where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their optimal health, regardless of race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, geography, preferred language, or other factors that affect access to care and health outcomes. CMS is working to advance health equity by designing, implementing, and operationalizing policies and programs that support health for all the people served by our programs, eliminating un, um, avoidable differences in outcomes experienced by those who are disadvantaged or historically un, underserved, and providing the care and support that our enrollees need to survive. And specifically to the Innovation Center, as part of our strategy to improve quality, we're committed, as I said, to embedding equity into all aspects of our models um, and increasing the focus on underserved populations. Our work in this space will include increasing the number of beneficiaries from underserved communities in the models, in part by increasing the providers that serve them, including Medicaid providers and those in FQHCs. Um, we need to be thinking about who participates in our models and we need to make sure we're reaching and recruiting providers and institutions who haven't joined our models in the past for example, increasing participation of safety net and rural providers um, and others that serve patients in underserved communities. And then additionally, our application and selection processes should encourage participation of providers and not be a barrier. We need to look at our previous models to identify the barriers and challenges um, that safety net and, and rural providers have faced and um, in participating in our models and try to think about ways of engaging them moving forward. And then finally, we need to be providing technical assistance, financial assistance um, to ensure diversity of providers and mix of patients. Um, upfront infrastru infrastructure investments might be needed for safety net providers to succeed in value-based care arrangements. 
Um, this could include um, social risk adjustments, benchmark considerations, and payment incentives for reducing disparities or screening for social determinants of health. Um, on the technical support side, we're thinking about application support and sharing best practices um, for caring for underserved populations and assistance maybe with screening tools and data collection workflows. And our um, strategies focus on equity and promoting accountable care extends to our work in Medicaid. Um, the Innovation Center will continue taking advantage of significant opportunities that Medicaid alignment provides to reach vulnerable populations. For those who wanna learn more, um, we did, as I mentioned, hold an equity roundtable in December. Uh, it was a great event that walked through our strategy and engaged stakeholders for feedback. Uh, the slides in the transcript for the event are available on the CMS Innovation website. So if you wanna hear what we discussed, I would suggest taking um, more a closer look at that. Thank you, Liz. And it really is um, amazing or great to see how much you um, and the administrator and Mina are really having these listening sessions and inviting people to come in, both when you create the strategy and, and now to in part of the, the refinement and the feedback and the implementation part. Um, you know, I think, as I mentioned, listening to, to people really is part of our approach and um, uh, belief in how we can fix our healthcare system. But, you know, we, we don't hear people talk about ECOs or bundles or CMMI models. Um, they really do talk about the system that is affordable, dependable, personal, easy to navigate, you know, wrapped up in that is, is respectful for their lives and their bodies. Um, and you know we there's there's so much room to do better in our healthcare system, um, and to really meet those needs of people. As you think about specifically navigating the healthcare system, which is so complex and confusing, um, how do you picture the work that you can do um, at the innovation center to really to meet, help people and make a system that is easy to navigate? That's a great question. And I will say US of Care has done a really great job of listening. You've got a great antenna for priorities, fears, hopes across the US, US healthcare landscape and um, not just with people, but providers as well. You know, I, I said we wanted to listen more closely with patients and I'll tell you at the Innovation Center, we, we have spent a lot of time talking to providers and health systems, payers and purchasers. But, you know, to be quite honest, we haven't done enough to talk to patients um, and hear from them what they want from their providers and their health systems. So we're working on a strategy that mirrors what we've been trying to do with health equity. If we were, if we were to build in a patient perspective into our models from the very start, what would that look like and where would we start? Um, as we're measuring quality, for example, we need to understand whether the measures that we're using are meaningful to patients. Um, thinking about ways of aligning measures with goals that matter to patients and matter and they align with their patients' values and um, like increasing years of active living. Um, similarly, when we talk about cost savings, and I mentioned this earlier, we have, we've been thinking about it from a trust fund perspective, Medicare spending, and that's important, but those sorts of savings don't necessarily accrue to patients. And so in the strategy, when we're talking about affordability, um, we also want to consider patients and thinking about um, models, for example, like drug spending. Um, as a first step to figuring out what patients care about, we convened focus groups um, on the new strategy. And what we found was that the language we're using doesn't really speak to patients. The term accountable care was interpreted as skimping on care, not better care or care coordination. Um, when you when you have patients with chronic conditions, they understand the value of coordinated care, but patients with fewer healthcare needs don't understand that concept. Um, and the term health equity also doesn't resonate. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, frankly, um, starting with about how we talk about our work, our goals and our models. Um, we're hoping to have a listening session about the strategy that will focus on patients and consumers and get their perspective. So more to come on this part of the strategy as the year unfolds, but in the short term, we'd welcome participation in, in the learning sessions um, and our website will provide details when we have them. Great. Um, and another part of your the strategy that you laid out really was this, um, which is so intriguing to me, the broaden the work beyond the whole of government approach. Um, and in that you, you said that that means partnerships with employers, health plans and states, as well as patients, caregivers, providers and community organizations. I'd love to hear more about that and um, this, this idea of the whole of, you know, work beyond the whole of government approach. 
Yeah, well, I, we are thinking about multi-payer alignment. Um, it's a critical part of our strategy. We know that Medicare is a catalyst for change and the health system won't change without Medicare playing a significant role, but we can't do it alone. Um, and we need to be working more closely with, um, with other payers in the system and including um, departments of health at the state level and Medicaid agencies. And we need to think differently about um, multi-payer alignment. Um, as I mentioned, we used to think of it as a success if a payer joined one of our specific models. But what we've heard is that joining our models is not an easy lift. It's actually um, quite burdensome. And um, you know, it requires a certain level of um, performance and reporting and timing. It has to align with our timing. So you know, in terms of what an effective approach to multi-peer alignment looks like, probably somewhere between broad concepts and principles and model specifications, we're thinking it might mean aligning on APM design features, that's alternative payment model design features like clinical tools, outcome measures, um, payment policy approaches, and strengthening primary care. Um, there's a goal for, there's a role for driving alignment through the learning and action network or the LAN. Um, we've launched a national accountable care action collaborative that includes recommendations on key design fe features. We're thinking about geographies that are best suited for innovation models where there's might be a convergence of innovation, maybe a critical mass of potential partners, a willing state health authority, and other factors that might combine to make these efforts more successful. Um, and this ties in with our December launch of the LANS um, state transformation collaboratives. And also we're thinking about becoming a convener. Um, we can be a convener like we're doing with the LAN, but also a joiner. Um, maybe we can borrow from or build on other organization strategies. So it's not an approach that we've used in the future or in the past, but something we're looking at for the future. Well, excited to hear more about that. And, and speaking of the future, you know, closing us out, um, we're 10 years into CMMI. Uh, you have the roadmap for the next 10 years. Fast forward to 2030, what does success look like um, you know, for our healthcare system? And, and you know, how, how can CMMI help drive that? Well, a core part of our strategy is really thinking about a more streamlined model portfolio. And we're really committed to a more cohesive articulation of how all the models fit together. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're advancing our um, objectives that we've laid out in the white paper. Uh, and we also wanna make sure that we're actually having an impact on health system transformation in terms of cost savings, quality improvement, reducing disparities, achieving delivery system change, and also in terms of likelihood of successful um, execution with a strong potential for adoption and scaling by non-participants um, as well as model participants. Um, and we also, as I mentioned and you referenced, um, working more closely with other parts of CMS, the Center for Medicare and the Center for Medicaid and um, CHIP services. So their work should inform our models and not necessarily the other way around. We've sort of been a little bit siloed sort of doing our thing. Um, but really, if we want to be successful, what we're doing, if it's successful, needs to be um, transferred and, and part of um, other parts of the program. So we're thinking about um, model tests um, that we could have in place by 2030, um, model tests that include um, accountability for total cost of care and outcomes, advanced primary care model tests, specialty care model tests that support integrated whole person care, and then um, state total cost of care model tests. Great. Well, thank you, Liz, for um, your your thoughts today and for really discussing the future through of the Innovation Center through through your strategy document. Um, and as I said, thank you for your service to our to our government. Um, right now, we will hand it over to our communications director at United States of Care, Laura Smith, who will read questions that we received um, in the registration process and uh, in this webinar. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Natalie. And as I begin to ask the questions of Dr. Fowler, please feel free to go ahead and submit your questions um, for her, her in the using the Q&A function. So go ahead and start doing that if you haven't already. Thank you. Okay, so this first question is related to federally qualified health centers, commonly known as FQHCs. Dr. Fowler, how does CMMI, um, do, does CMMI have any plans to develop initiatives specific to FQHCs and what are they? 
Well, I think this gets back to trying to make sure that we're incorporating providers that maybe hadn't participated in our models in the past. Um, and those serving underserved populations and FQHCs certainly count, as well as rural health clinics um, and other safety net providers. So we are actually thinking about um, how to do this. We're thinking about the barriers to participation now. What is it, why haven't they come in? Um, we're looking closely at participants who may have tried to come in, but didn't quite make it across the finish line. What was it that kept them from, um, from succeeding? And then also, um, you know, those who didn't even try to apply. And, and I think this is gonna require some outreach and some listening. Um, we have heard from some FQHCs that are interested in coming into models. And um, we wanna know, you know, why, um, why they hadn't in the past. So it's part of our strategy to think about safety net providers. And um, I think more to come on that in the future. Great. Um, this next question is about behavioral health. Specifically, how are you thinking about addressing the need for more value-based care in behavioral health? Yes, behavioral health is a really important area and it's um, been a priority for the secretary as well as for CMS. And I think there's a whole internal working group that's um, thinking about behavioral health. Um, and especially in this time, um, at this particular moment, um, when we hear a lot about behavioral health and mental health, um, we are, I talked to you a little bit about our strategy and how we're thinking about streamlining and harmonizing the portfolio. We're trying to think about how we can incorporate these services into, into something bigger than just a disease specific model. So rather than doing a behavioral health standalone model, how is it that we can bring them into our other, um, our other models? How is it that we could integrate their, um, that care into a primary care model, for example? Um, so I think that's a question we're asking whenever we get a sort of a specific area where someone's saying, do a model in this specific area rather than a specific model. Could we think about how to incorporate it? And so that's how we've been thinking about um, behavioral health. And we know we haven't done a lot in this area. So um. Great. Um, the next question is about stakeholder engagement. How is the administration thinking about engaging stakeholders in support of your priorities? In other words, how can stakeholders help? So we have thought about doing all sorts of things. So we've been doing listening sessions, as I mentioned. We thought about doing like an RFI, a request for information where we throw out there, like help us think about this. Um, but but um, if, if we were able to travel, at this point we're not able to travel, I would love to do more site visits. And like I said, actually going on the ground and talking to people on the ground because I think the, the listening sessions are helpful, but it's sort of who knows about them and is able to you know, sign up and join. And, and I'm not sure we're touching all parts of the system that we need to be listening to and particularly patients. So we are doing listening sessions. Um, we are soliciting feedback. We've gotten a lot of feedback um, through our website and we're tracking that pretty um, closely. If at some point we get to where we can actually go out and hear from people, I think I'd I'd really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Someday so, we hope. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And and you know, I think for all the folks on the call too, we're interested in hearing from you. So um, you're part of this tour as well. Wonderful. Uh, moving on to accountable care. What are CMMI's plans for your accountable care portfolio? So we have, um, we are looking closely at accountable care as that's um, a key part of the strategy is we think that it's a way to drive better care um, for people who have a physician who is actually looking out for their care. Um, we've been working across CMS, um, working with the Center on Medicare um, to have a more, um, I guess, coordinated portfolio on accountable care models. And that means working with the Center on Medicare um, and thinking about making sure that what we're doing is relevant to the Medicare Shared Savings Program and that we're reflecting uh, what they think they need to learn and incorporate um, more providers in their models. So I think it's, it's sort of a shared approach. Um, we're also looking down the road of um, more advanced primary care um, models, and I think there's work going on on that front as well. Um, you know, I think we're in a little bit of a transition here as we think about what's in the pipeline and what we want to do differently. So 
hopefully you'll hear more from us soon. Thank you. Uh, the next question is on risk adjustment. How is the Innovation Center considering risk adjustment in the future models? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. There's been a lot of um, a lot written about the ability to engage in coding and upcoding games, and um, it's a way of maybe um, getting better payments or higher payments without actually delivering care. And we're very well attuned to some of the trends that we're seeing. And um, the CMS Inno Innovation Center is looking at opportunities to improve or replace our current risk adjustment methodology. Um, it's really crucial to ensure that innovation is really around care delivery and not just better ways of gaming the health system and upcoding. Um, we really want the focus to be on um, care delivery and improving outcomes and not, and not on coding games. Um, so this is especially important as we're thinking about models um, related to addressing health equity and how we're making sure we're engaging participants that wanna work with underserved populations and um, rather than just seeing these populations as opportunities for higher payment. So um, as a result of this focus, um, we've taken the opportunity to address this challenge in um, our ongoing models. Um, the, we have in one of our models, a, an overall um, constraint on risk score growth um, that's applied across the entire program and applied individually to um, specific model participants. And um, some of these lessons, if we if they are successful, could be applied to um, the Medicare Shared Savings Program um, or the Medicare Advantage Plan. Thank you. Um, when you think about the role of people receiving and giving care, how is the Innovation Center focusing on patients and caregivers? That's a great question. And I've seen some of that in the chat too, and, and really ways of focusing that. And as we're thinking about um, engaging more with patients, I think that also includes our partnership with caregivers um, and, um, and um, thinking about um, those who are spending a lot of their time and energy and effort caring for loved ones. Um, it's not an area where we've spent a lot of time. I think we have some models um, focused on palliative care um, or you know, end of life care, but I think we could be doing a lot more in this area um, and thinking about changes we have to um, make to incorporate um, caregiver voices as well as patient voices. Um, so we haven't brought these voices into our process early enough, but I think I really believe that that's an area where we could do more. And um, so I think that's why we're gonna focus the next listening session um, on these topics in particular. Thank you. And the next question is a bit of a follow-up. So they asked, uh, the move to include more patients in the strategic planning process is laudable. How will the Innovation Center integrate patient perspectives into its work? How will you help patients successfully engage with the center? So that is the crux of what we're uh, trying to do. I think you heard, um, you know, I think we learned a lot from doing a, um, a series of focus groups um, that the way that we're talking to patients um, doesn't resonate. The language we're using doesn't resonate. Um, you, unless you're a patient with um, chronic conditions that has trouble navigating the health system, um, coordinating care um, and better coordination and navigation um, doesn't really resonate if you're not somebody that uses the um, health system regularly. So um, we are, I think, starting a series of listening sessions and um, trying to do more outreach. I think we're building those relationships with um, patient organizations. We've talked about doing regular listening sessions, um, even just touching base with, here are the models that we're doing. Um, help us think about who we should be talking to um, as we're thinking about oncology care models, for example, um, as we think about quality metrics, what are the metrics that matter most for um, patients with cancer? Um, it's you know, not always the question we've asked. Um, and then where we have asked the question, where, where our evaluations have asked questions about patients, I don't think we're bringing those lessons out enough. So um, we're also looking back at all our previous evaluations um, to see where we do have some of these learnings that could be applied to other models and potentially um, putting more out there publicly as well. That's really exciting. 
So uh, how is the Innovation Center thinking about nesting or integrating specialty care and episodes into accountable care organizations? That's also, you guys are starting to get at the real crux of what we're, we're grappling with. Um, you know, I think as we did a listening tour to, you know, what's worked over the last 10 years, what we found is that some of our models conflicted with each other um, or collided, as someone explained. So you might be a health system that is involved in um, bundled payments and involved in an ACO and there's competing financial incentives. Um, so they're not necessarily aligned even for the same provider. So rather than trying to, um, this is what I meant when I said, we're trying to harmonize our models. We're trying to think um, more closely about um, how the models can work together. And I think if we are putting accountable care and this notion of accountable care at the center of what we're doing, I think we can't continue to do um, models that focus on individual episodes or specialties, but we really need to think about giving tools to primary care providers and accountable care um, organizations to be able to manage that care. And so that's the notion of nesting. So can we test those episodes within the context of, for example, the Medicare Shared Savings Program? I know it's really complicated and the evaluation team tells me it's very complicated, um, but this is what we're trying to do going forward. And, and I think there's a related um, lesson in here because I saw a few questions coming in about social determinants of health, which we haven't talked that much about. We had a separate model on a, um, the accountable health communities that's coming to an end um, later this um, year. We've learned a lot about social determinants and referring patients for community services um, and the relationship between providers and those community organizations. But rather than have a standalone model that just does that in one model for a very limited set of providers, are there lessons that we could bring from that model into um, what we're doing? For example, the I keep bringing it back to the oncology model, but should they be asking about social determinants? Um, you know, access to nutrition, transportation, housing is gonna impact the outcomes for those patients. And so we're thinking about how to embed those um, lessons from social determinants models into um, what we're doing on um, in other models. That's great. And you got right into the next question we had. So I'll go to the next one, which is how is the CMS Innovation Center considering increasing value-based care adoption in rural areas, particularly those with physician shortages? Yes, um, we see rural areas as um, part of the underserved population. So when we talk about health equity and reaching underserved populations, it's not just about um, areas where there have been historically um, low access to care, but also thinking about rural areas. And as somebody from who grew up in Kansas and went to school in Minnesota, um, I have a very keen interest in making sure that the, um, that's part of our strategy. So. We do have one model that's focused on rural areas, the chart model um, that was launched last year. I think we're, um, you know, still we're seeing how that how that goes um, and looking for other opportunities to engage with rural health providers um, in our health equity efforts. Building on that, uh, many of the models require large populations to test, which can be hard for small population frontier states. So how can CMMI include smaller states in your innovation efforts? So in terms of the states that we're engaging, I mentioned that we met, uh, we launched a state transformation um, collaborative in December, and we purposely looked for states that weren't always the big states with the big populations with a lot of providers, but Arkansas is one of our states, North Carolina, um, Colorado, as well as California. So California is still in there, but we are looking for opportunities to go in places where we haven't uh, been before. I think that's part of, you know, if you look at our map of where models have, have been conducted, there are gaps um, in those places. And it's our goal to try to fill in some of those gaps and, and find models that can engage um, providers and participants in those areas. Um, switching gears a little bit, but it's sort of related, they're all related, but can you share your thoughts on how models can support non-medical needs for Medicare beneficiaries, such as meal delivery? Yeah, we do have one model that is, um, it's the value-based insurance design model um, that gives um, Medicare Advantage plans the flexibility to be able to provide 
um, medical, um, medically nutritious um, meals or medically um, um, recommended meals uh, for patients uh, that may, may, may be facing, um, you know, um, hunger or um, specific nutritional needs that are related to a diet um, that's part of their care. Um, you know, moving it out of um, that model into others, I think, is is what we're thinking about next. Keep in mind that we have we have looked at um, whether we can do those types of models in other care settings, and I'm I'm not sure. We we have to go through the actuary um, at CMS, and they have to say yes, this is going to save money. So we've been in conversations with the actuary that if we provided, you know. Um, medical food as medicine in um, in these models, could we generate the level of savings that would allow us to go forward? And so we're still working through some of those conversations, but um, it's it's sort of an ongoing interest of ours, but we haven't quite got there yet. Thank you. Um, we've recognized that primary care is important for quality and to manage total costs. So how is the Innovation Center thinking about enhancing primary care? Well, if you follow closely, we've had, we're on our third primary care um, model. Uh, we had the comprehensive primary care model, the, which is the CPC model. We had the CPC plus model. And uh, last year we launched the primary care first model, which is an advanced primary care model. The team is looking at um, how that model's doing. I think we have another cohort that started this year. And we're looking beyond that. I think the teams that have been working on the primary care models are thinking about the next generation. So um, I think we've decided that it's important to double down on primary care. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in primary care. I know USF Care, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine has a whole report on the role of primary care. If you look at other countries' healthcare systems that have you know, better outcomes um, at lower cost than our healthcare system, a lot of them have a very prominent role for primary care. So we think that's uh, really fundamental to um, building a better healthcare system. Thank you. Uh, there are questions about how total cost of care models might impact underserved populations, those with disabilities or other needs. How can models mitigate these concerns? Yeah, I think, and again, this is getting back to, I'm not sure we're using the language in the right way. When we say total cost of care, it's not about a it's not necessarily a capitated approach where you only get this much money and manage the care within that. It's really about, I mean, it can involve capitation, but it really is about somebody who's looking across the spectrum of your care and trying to coordinate that care. So having responsibility for not just the primary care needs, um, but also thinking about um, what are those social determinants and also thinking about specialty care and making sure that patients are going to um, specialists that are providing better care, having a, an understanding of where those high quality providers are and making sure that they're paid appropriately and, um, and that we're seeing the better outcomes. Um, so I, I think it's not about skimping on care, which is something that we keep hearing people are misunderstanding how we're thinking about it. It's really about looking across the spectrum of care and trying to do a better job of coordinating that care. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about the intersection between housing and health? Well, this is going back to the social determinants. Um, and, you know, this is, I think there are a few areas where um, the secretary of HHS has expressed a very keen interest. Um, I'd say social determinants of health, behavioral health is another one, health equity as well. Um, and I believe that we are tasked with um, helping patients think about housing um, in our models, but also across HHS, there are efforts ongoing to think about housing. I know my colleagues in other parts of the department in the um, assistant, assistant secretary for planning and evaluation has built connections with um, HUD, with the housing um, department to think about how we might um, work together where patient care might depend on having better housing, more affordable housing. So I'm not, part of those conversations, but I know that they're ongoing and I'm just as excited about them as the secretary. So I know that I know that we're thinking about that and I know that that's part of the overall strategy and some of it we have insight into and some of it we're eagerly awaiting um, 
more instruction and more more guidance. Okay, so we'll, we're, you're doing great with the rapid fire. We'll fit in a couple more and then wrap up. So um, the next one is, can you talk more about how CMMI is thinking about how clinical services and community services might work together to better improve care for patients with high medical needs and complex social challenges? Yeah, I think this is related to the social determinants question. And um, I think one of the things that we learned from our model is that, um, um, providers don't always know where to send patients. Um, and in some cases, if, um, if those community organizations are um, to be adequately reimbursed for the services they're providing, sometimes making that linkage has been a challenge as well. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, our diabetes prevention program uses community-based organizations, including for example, YMCA um, organizations to deliver that care trying to get them in um, and process them as providers has been a challenge um, to get them licensed or whatever they need to, to be um, accredited to um, be paid under our model. And um, sometimes that's just, a, we don't know, we haven't been the best at dealing with them and they haven't necessarily known how to deal with us and, um, and all of our requirements and paperwork. And so I think we can, make, we can do more to make that a more smooth process um, and those, Talking to Administrator Brooks Lashur, I know she wants us to figure out a way to work more closely with community-based organizations. And so, you know, that's part of ongoing work that we need to do. How is CMMI thinking about helping rural hospitals who do not have a good infrastructural foundation to be able to participate in value-based payment models? Well, I think that looks at, um, you know, we had a model called um, AIM, um, which was providing upfront money for um, investments into um, what providers might need to be able to participate in models. We are looking at refreshing um, some of those mechanisms. Um, so if providers need upfront um, funding in order to participate, maybe we can give them advance payments um, in anticipation of, of their participation, looking at mechanisms like that. Um, you know, we have to make our models work from a financial perspective, but they also have to work for providers as well and participants. Okay, here's your last question. And I apologize to all those who we couldn't get to because we've got so many great questions that were submitted. So here it is. Is CMMI thinking about launching new models or is it really about revamping and reorganizing your portfolio? I think it's both. Um, so we have pulled back some models. Um, we had, for example, a Part D modernization model that didn't, it only had 1% of plans participating. It didn't have enough participation to be able to evaluate it. So we, we ended up pulling it down. Um, we pulled down, um, there was a geographic um, direct contracting model. We put that one on hold. There were a lot of questions and concerns about that model. Um, so that model is on hold. Um, we're looking at across the portfolio where, where the models look to bring success and have enough participants to be able to evaluate. Um, and then going forward, uh, we're using um, a very specific criteria um, to consider new models. So they've got to align with the strategy. They've got to align with the direction we're going. Um, and so, and you know, the other point, and maybe this is a little bit inside CMMI, but we want the teams to be working together and not reinventing the wheel. So, so part of what we found is that some of the models were sort of coming up with their own unique way of doing IT and the, and the um, strategies they were building. We need to be able to share um, learnings across the models a little bit better. So I guess it's three things. So where the models might not be uh, robust enough, we'll sort of pull them back or um, we have a new strategy to um, move um, new models through the pipeline that align with the strategy, and then sharing learnings across um, all of the models to make sure that we're as efficient as possible. Thank you so much. And I'll now hand it back to Natalie for some closing thoughts. Great, thank you. And thank you everybody who submitted questions and we'll um, do as much as we can with technology to, to download those and share them with Liz and her team. Um, Cause I know there were a lot we couldn't get to. 
Um, like I said, thank you for everyone for joining us, uh, Liz and your team for spending time with us today to really discuss the future of the Innovation Center and, and how you will undoubtedly have wide ranging impacts on our healthcare system. Um, as we conclude this webinar, I'd like to invite you all to join our next virtual event um, coming up on January 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, where we will talk about the conclusion of the healthcare.gov open enrollment season, um, hosting a discussion to assess emerging enrollment strategies and highlight the latest innovations and strategies to enroll people in healthcare coverage. We hope you can join us. Um, we, as well as so many of you I know who uh, are participating and here with us today, have ambitious goals for making our healthcare system more affordable, dependable, personalized, and understandable. And we can't do our work without partnerships and support. So thank you all for, for joining us in this work together. Thanks again to, um, to Dr. Liz Fowler and our federal partners and the state lawmakers who are really working with us to make the healthcare system better. Um, as we continue our work, we appreciate your support and partnership. Thank you very much. Everybody stay safe and healthy. Thanks, Natalie. Bye-bye. Thank